We've been talking about Jesus being our great high priest in the book of Hebrews. It's a topic that, that this particular book of the Bible spends a, f- a few chapters considering, exploring what it means to have Jesus as our great high priest and, and how he serves in this, in this role. Last week when we looked at chapter 9 of Hebrews, well, we learned that uh, chapter, chapters 8 and 9, really, that, that the earthly tabernacle, the one that God instructed the Israelites to build at Mount Sinai and is constructed in, this, in the second half of Exodus, was a copy of the heavenly things. Okay? That's where we learned that, that this tent that, sh- that had been set up, which later became the temple in Jerusalem, was a copy of a heavenly, more real reality pertaining to God's presence. Uh, it wasn't just an arbitrary building uh, that God made, uh, had the Israelites build in an ornate fashion, but it reflected the truth about God's presence and, and what it would be like to enter it. Now, Jesus, our great high priest, did not serve in the tabernacle like all the high priests in the Old Testament because he didn't serve in the copy of God's presence. His ministry as our priest was performed in the real thing itself. When Jesus entered God's presence to serve as our priest and is seated at God's right hand, continuing to perform that role for us to this very day. Jesus didn't minister in the copy of the heavenly reality. Jesus entered God's presence itself, the real deal, to serve as our priest. But in order to do that, Jesus had to make a sacrifice. Just like the high priest offered a sacrifice for the people on the Day of Atonement when they could go behind the curtain inside the tabernacle and go into God's presence, so too Jesus offered a sacrifice so that he could approach the presence of God and serve as a priest on our behalf. His sacrifice, of course, was the sacrifice of himself on the cross. And that is how chapter 9 ended, by explaining that this sacrifice is what Jesus came here to do. In chapter 9 we read, but he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Continuing on, it says, just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. I want to talk to you about sacrifices today. Hebrews 10, uh, that we're going to be looking at, will take us a little deeper into what kind of sacrifice that Jesus offered on our behalf. I invite you to open there with me, because that's where we'll be this morning. In fact, as as we get started here, I'd I'd like to start by reading the first six verses of Hebrews 10. It's important to not peek ahead. We're just going to read the first six, okay? Verse six, uh, starting in verse one of Hebrews 10, it says, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming. Of course, this is talking about the tabernacle and the sacrificial system there. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once and for all uh, and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, now we're going to read a quote from Psalm chapter 40. He said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me with burnt offerings and sin offerings you are not pleased. I want to highlight the mixed message here, and I'm wondering if you caught it. Maybe there are too many words, so let me provide a paraphrase. At the end of chapter 9, the book of Hebrews tells us that Christ was sacrificed once to take away our sins. Hooray! Okay? But then we start in chapter 10, and it says, sacrifices are lame and God hates them. Boo! Okay, you see the contrast there? Jesus was our great sacrifice. That's great. Hallelujah. He took away our sins. And then chapter 10, it says, "Ah, sacrifices are are garbage. God doesn't want those. Wait a second. Sounds like a Husker fan trying to decide whether or not they like their coach. 
And like chapter 9 is the Northwestern game, and chapter 10 is Illinois, maybe? Okay. Why are these passages, which are right next to each other, so schizophrenic about sacrifice? Let me show you first that what we read in chapter 10, 1 through 6, where it said that sacrifices are lame and God hates them, was not novel or new to the Bible. There are lots of passages like that. There are a number of occasions on which God says that he despises sacrifices, which is weird for God to say because it was God who told the Israelites to offer sacrifices when he gave them the law at Mount Sinai and gave them uh, these instructions about many different kinds of sacrifices that they were to offer on many different occasions on which they were to offer sacrifices. If you've ever tried to read Leviticus, you know about the specificity with which uh, God's law deals with sacrifices and how they're to be performed in worship to him. God had set up this whole system of sacrifice in the first place at Mount Sinai. But not long after that, we get passages like this in the Old Testament. In Jeremiah 6, chapter 20, uh, I'm sorry, in chapter 6, verse 20, it says, What do I care about incense from Sheba or sweet calamus from a distant land? Your burnt offerings are not acceptable. Your sacrifices do not please me. In Hosea 8, 13, it says, Though they offer sacrifices as gifts to me, and though they eat the meat, the Lord is not pleased with them. Now he will remember their wickedness and punish their sins, and they will return to Egypt. God obviously isn't happy with these sacrifices, even though he's the one that told them to offer them. It gets even stronger than this language, these two passages. In Isaiah 66, 3, it says, Whoever sacrifices a bull is like one who kills a person. Whoever offers a lamb is like one who breaks a dog's neck. Whoever makes a grain offering is like one who presents pig's blood. God is saying, your sacrifices to me are gross. I hate them. God told them to offer these sacrifices. I haven't even shown you the best one yet. It's really fun. I'm thinking about making this a new memory verse for our kids in Sunday school. Uh, in Malachi chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Because of you, I will rebuke your descendants. I will smear on your faces the dung from your festival sacrifices. He's really not happy with their sacrifices. Okay? If you can pick up a little note of displeasure here, I think you're on the right track. Okay? I will smear on your faces the dung from your festival sacrifices, and you will be carried off with it. They'll take you wherever they take the dung, because I don't like your sacrifices. Remember, God is the one who told them to do these. So what is the problem here? Why is he saying now that they do no good? Why is he upset with them? Why now do these sacrifices anger God and make him want to smear dung on their faces? I tell you, it is because these sacrifices were offered by a people who were disobedient and unfaithful. And the people offering them were confused about what it is that God wanted. They were confused into thinking that it was the sacrifices that God wanted. Because God told them how to offer sacrifices to him in worship, they thought God wants our sacrifices. And this whole uh, the, through the whole story of the Old Testament, we, we have this contrast of, of people thinking that they can appease God through their sacrifices and, and, it, and that they can t continue to belong to God if they maintain their sacrificial worship, the Levitical worship at the tabernacle and at the temple, but it fails. It is not the case. God did not want their sacrifice. God's greatest desire was for their faithfulness and for their obedience. And the sacrifices were ancillary to that. Not ancillary in the way of being unnecessary. They couldn't have skipped them, you see. The sacrifices were necessary because of their sin, 
And necessary because of the divide that we've been talking about in Hebrews between a holy God and, and the sinful people. But don't get it mixed up. God doesn't want sacrifices. He wants obedience and he wants faithfulness from his people. So what about this one? What about this sacrifice? What would make this one any different? Let's turn back to Hebrews 10. We're going to pick up in verse 5, which we've already read. We'll go back, backwards a little bit. Verse 5, we're going to start at the beginning of that quotation from Psalms chapter 40. It says, Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. First he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. So here the author of Hebrews is recognizing what we already have, that, that God is the one who told them to make these sacrifices, but they were not pleasing God. In verse 9 now, then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first, the sacrifices, to establish the second, obedience to God. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. You see, Christ offered a righteous sacrifice. And that made all the difference. That's what makes Jesus' death so special. His righteousness, that means his right standing with God, the fact that he had, he had done no wrong, that he had not rebelled against God, that he had not been disobedient in any way, his righteousness and faithfulness to God is what makes the difference, what makes his sacrifice different than all the ones that we read about earlier that displeased God so badly. The Psalm 40 quotation here is provided in context in your bullet. You can see more of that chapter. And if you, if you look there, the whole psalm is about is about a worshiper of God who wants to do God's will and wants to give him praise. He wants to do what will please God. And this is what the author of Hebrews is citing here and says, look, God doesn't want sacrifices. He doesn't want blood of bulls and rams. This is what he wants. He wants someone to do his will. Someone whose heart is bent on pleasing God. This is why Jesus' sacrifice is different than all the rest. This is why his blood can take away our guilt. That's why Jesus can enter into God's presence and serve as our high priest. This is why all the other sacrifices outlined in the Levitical law could stop and never return. Why there was no need for them anymore. Jesus did God's will. He was completely faithful completely righteous. And that enabled him to offer a kind of sacrifice that none of us are able to provide, that none of the Israelites were able to provide, that no one else other than Jesus himself could perform. This sacrifice that Jesus offered would not be ignored because it was faithful. This sacrifice would not be despised by God because it was righteous. This sacrifice would not be repeated because it was divine. Reading on now in verse 11 of Hebrews chapter 10. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again. He offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, for by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. You see, there's a finality conveyed here in what the author of Hebrews says about Jesus' sacrifice. It says that when Jesus had offered this sacrifice, he sat down 
right? That's the imagery of, of being finished, of being at, at rest, that, that this sacrifice put an end to all the rest and that Christ, our high priest, was able to be seated after it had been offered. And then notice that what makes this sacrifice special is Christ's holiness. That's what makes this sacrifice different than all the ones offered before. A holy sacrifice is what started all of this. We're gathered in a church today, and, and every Sunday, as heirs of this gospel preached for centuries and millennia, the message that a holy sacrifice was offered by one who was righteous and faithful. We are here today because of that proclamation, that truth, that announcement. And I want you to notice here in God's word, in verse 14, it's up on the screen, that we are not just to receive the benefit of the gift. It's not just that, that we are here to receive the benefit of Christ's sacrifice and have our sins forgiven, but we are also to receive the quality of its giver. Do you see? For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. We join this movement of the gospel. We join this, this people of the church, and we join this cause of our Christian faith, not by offering sacrifices ourselves, but by striving for and living out the holiness that made Christ's sacrifice count. The holiness is the distinguishing factor that made Christ's sacrifice different, and we, as Christ's people, as people who have Jesus Christ as our Lord, are to embody that holiness, are to adopt his way. Here, holiness means the purity of our faithfulness and our righteousness. This is what Hebrews 10 tells us to do about Christ's righteous sacrifice, as we see reading on in verse 15. It says, the Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this, about us who are being made holy. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Here again, Hebrews quotes from Jeremiah 31, uh, just like he did in, in chapter 8. This is a passage that he's returning to uh, now again. He does so to emphasize that we belong to the promised people of God with changed hearts and changed minds. That's the characteristic of this new people, not, not now just people descended from Abraham, marked by circumcision, but Jeremiah 31 promised a people for God that would have changed hearts and minds. And that is, how, that is our identifying marker. That is how you become a part of the gospel. Of, that's how you become a part of Christ's body, the church. Our participation in this sacrifice of Jesus is our obedience to God. We cannot, and it would not help for us to, to shed blood to pay for our sins. Because Christ's blood was shed already. His sacrifice was once and for all. But what we can do is participate in the defining characteristic of his sacrifice that made it work. His righteousness. We can walk in holiness, in the path of our Savior, and in doing, participate in what pleases God. And this is what makes us people of the cross. Not that we don't confess Jesus' death on the cross. We should, and we do. Not that we don't venerate the cross. We do. But we are people of the cross if we emulate the righteous life which empowered it. Without Christ's righteousness, the cross is just a sad story about uh, a, a criminal, a blasphemer, who was punished by the Roman government. But because of Christ's righteousness, it was a sacrifice once and for all that paid the price for our sins. So our response to that gift should be righteousness in kind. It should be to pursue holiness like our Savior so that we can please God. 
And that is my invitation to you as we approach communion this morning. What share do you have in the sacrifice of Christ that cleansed you from sin? What share do you have in it if your life is full of sin? If Christ's sacrifice was special because of Christ's righteousness, and you have no concern about righteousness, if you have no desire for holiness, no longing to do what pleases God, then what makes you a part of that? If you're living a life full of resisting God's will and knowing what God wants for you or knowing the truth and, and, and fighting against it, rejecting it or ignoring it, what share do you have in the sacrifice that was made? How does this righteous sacrifice belong to you? Through this righteous sacrifice on the cross, the one we remember at communion when we partake of the bread and of the juice, through this sacrifice, we are allowed behind the curtain in the tabernacle. We are given access to God's presence. And you remember that for the priest to do that, he had to cleanse himself. He had to offer an atoning sacrifice for his own sins. He had to, take, uh, he had to bathe ritually and, and, and cleanse himself and, and wear new, clean clothes. And he, he had to be free from sin to enter into God's presence. Christ has offered a sacrifice for our cleansing once and for all. But the invitation to us as his followers is to not defile the sanctuary when we follow him behind the curtain. That's why we examine ourselves at communion. That's why we take time to purge our own unrighteousness. As a church, when it's time to come to the table, we take these moments of silence at communion to prayerfully commit to faithfulness so that we, will, uh, so that we can be among those who are made holy by our holy Savior. Will you do that today when we take it together? Before the bread touches your lips, will you repent of the sin that would turn any sacrifice vile? Will you tell the Lord in prayer that you will walk in obedience to him as did our Savior, whose body and blood we are remembering together? Our passage ends this way in Hebrews chapter 10, picking up in verse 17 with these words of encouragement. Then he adds another quote from Jeremiah 31. Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. There is no sacrifice for us to offer. Only Christ's sacrifice to remember. And Christ's righteous character for us to live out. David said to the Lord, You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. So he said, My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. So as we approach this time together as a church, let us go to communion this morning with that broken and contrite spirit, renewing our commitment to holiness because it was the holiness of our Savior which made all the difference for the sacrifice that he made. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we stand before you guilty of sin. Each of us having disobeyed you, having fallen short of righteousness. And God, in this moment, before we celebrate together the sacrifice that your son made to pay the price for our sins, we ask for your forgiveness. We repent for the times that we have fallen short. And dear Heavenly Father, together, as a church family, as brothers and sisters united by your name, we commit to following you, 
We commit to turning our hearts and our minds towards what will please you. We commit to holiness because our Savior Jesus was holy when he shed his blood. And we want to follow him as our Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the gift of your Son. Thank you for the sacrifice we could not make on our own. We praise in your name. Amen.